right, good evening everybody. I hope you are all doing well this evening. Um, I do know that we have a few additional uh, guests this evening in our classes. Um, I have a lot of uh, students that have been with me since day one here, uh, but we are picking up students right and left here, so that is good. We're actually, I think, up to about 15 or so students, so um, we're moving along pretty well. Um, what we're going to be covering this evening, uh, we're going to be covering uh, chapter one of real estate finance. Uh, now, you probably, if you are unfamiliar in regards to utilizing uh, Google Classroom, for those of you that are new, please note that all of your PowerPoints are going to be found in the classwork section of Google, uh, Google Classroom. So if you click on the classwork, it should give you a list of all of the uh, modules by chapter. And when you click on it, it'll be under course material is where you will find these slides if you want to take notes. So with that being said, what we're going to end up, like I said, we're going to start class today. Uh, we're going to begin with chapter one, uh, which is going to be the nature and the cycle of real estate finance. Okay, uh, so th this is initially going to be the very basis of how we deal with finance. Uh, when we're dealing with it from many different elements. Uh, so this kind of gives you the particular process of exactly how we are going to be putting things into play, uh, not only just in real estate, but just finance in general. Uh, so we want to start off uh, basically discussing uh, your big picture from, uh, I guess you could say, kind of a large scale viewpoint, okay? Uh, again, like I said, is, is we're looking at it first to get to put the groundwork down. We're putting down basically uh, the, how can I say this? We want to lay the foundation so you can have a better understanding of how everything goes together. Let's basically put it simple there. So as you can see right here on slide one, understand that in real estate, and not just in real estate, but also in finance, there are many different situations that you're going to be dealing with. There's a lot of factors. Uh, that goes into play here. Uh, number one, of course, is you have your construction influence, okay? Uh, as you're going through these situations, how construction and how it is producing basically gives it a viewpoint of where are we going. For example, okay, when construction is low, hey, I wanna ask you this question. When construction is low, sir, okay, do you think that house selling is gonna be strong? If there's not many building, not much building going on, do you think real estate is going to be very strong? No. Why do you say no? Um, people need houses to move into to buy them. Well, let me, I'm going to play along with you here. You said people need houses to move into. So my question is here, let me ask you this, sir. People need houses to move into, but why can't they just buy other people's homes? A little trick question there, right? Yeah. Okay. What happens is in this situation, those other people have to go where? To another home, right? So if you buy Mr. Eugene's home, does Mr. Eugene have to have a place to go? Of course. Eventually, somebody's not going to have a house. Okay? So in that situation is, is if construction is classified as being slow or not really competing at all, what's happening is, is you're going to see a slowdown in the, in the market. Okay? So, for example, I'll give you a real life hypothetical right now. What do you think is going on, uh, Mr. Eugene, with the construction cycle? Do you think construction is high, slow, or non existent? I mean, right now, for right this minute, <clears throat> I say it's probably a little slow uh, because uh, materials are hard to come by and, and with this COVID going on, now, it's really the damper on a lot of things. Okay. Do you think COVID, sir, has ended up caused um, prices? Has it affected prices in any way? You think COVID yeah, has? Think the numbers. Yeah, oh, hold on. He, he already knows. Go ahead and say it. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. What, say what you're going to say, though. All right, the lumber prices have shot up. Lumber prices have extremely shot up. Uh, one, of the, one of the guys that I know personally that builds properties, uh, he ended up telling me, suggesting I went down to Lowe's here in town. It was at one price. He left 
came back after lunch and it had went up four dollars okay within a few hours and if it goes up four dollars my question mr garrett for you sir is who eats that cost home builders or anyone who needs lumber home builders or anyone that needs it and so if it's a home builder mr garrett let me ask you this question let's say you're the builder Mr. Gary, if you're building the property, my question for you is, are you going to eat the cost or are you going to give it to the person that you sell the property to? I'm uh, going to give it to the buyer. There you go. So in that situation is, you're going to pass off the debt onto the buyer. So that means that that house that could have been built pre-COVID might only cost 200000 is now for sale for, guess what? For probably 300 okay there's a lot of houses that used to be around the 150 to 200 they're about 250 and 275 okay reason being is because construction does influence the overall not only real estate market but the finance market all together okay what about the credit system economy does credit play a big factor in real estate finance of course of course Aiden, if you have poor credit, are you going to be buying a lot of properties? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So in that situation is the credit system. What we're talking about, not only from your personal credit, but we're also talking about this. Say, for example, that Miss Leela, she is a banker. Okay. And she ends up, she's a banker and the government basically cuts lending off to her. Not just her, but to all the banks. Well, Mr. Eugene, is Ms. Leela going to go over, sir, and give you and your 200000 you want to buy your house? I got bad credit. She ain't. Well, if, well, what if you have good credit? But she knows she well, can't get the money from the government. Well, she has to go up on her. She, she has to go up, up on her stuff. stuff. That's yeah. right. So in that situation is, is in these situations when we're looking at for finance, we have to look at it from many different aspects. Construction, the banking industry as a whole, also, any financial like relationships that you have, your collateral, any type of hypothecation, and the leverage. So what we're talking about in these particular situations, and this is very key here, is that we want to make certain that people understand that there are multiple, multiple areas in regards to how it affects real estate finance. Now, Mr. Uh, Travis, got a question for you, sir is do you feel interest rates right now are fair they're about two or three percent right now you think that's fair enough yeah yeah mr eugene back when you and miss linda bought y'all's house uh 90s i'm assuming when y'all purchased your house uh what was interest rates approximately back then wait two or three percent how much two or three percent oh, no come on up way, no. on, up. way on up way on up so seven, eight percent. Seven, eight percent. Oh yeah. Did they ever get to ten percent? They did. They did. Yes. So ten percent. Does that still seem like a lot of money to you, Aiden? At ten percent, that's really not much. I mean, it's still ninety percent out there. Over the life of the house. There you go. That's what Mr. Eugene just said. He said over the life of the loan, ten percent is a ton. Okay. So I always like to bring this in, and I've, I've kind of been waiting on this part because I love to talk about this. So we're going to talk about here in a little bit, or not actually in this class, or this chapter, we'll talk about it in this class. We're going to talk about the truth in lending, okay? And when we get to that point, one of the key things that we're going to talk about in regards to truth in lending is when your client first gets pre-approved, they have to get a closing estimate, okay? And it estimates how much money they're going to spend for that loan, okay, and what their payments and all are going to be. We want our clients to end up knowing exactly how much money it's going to cost them from what they borrow to what they're actually going to pay back. Now, Mr. Eugene, when we said even at, say, 5 10%, you still said it's a lot of money. But, but wait a minute. Me and Mr. Aiden, we went to school together here. We went to this place called Blinn College, and... Uh, and so we end up, Mr. Aiden, if I'm correct, 5% of $100 is only $5. That's sure. not a lot of money. You're Five smarter, than, you're smarter than most of my students. I'm smart. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so 
five bucks. That's not really a lot of cash, is it, Peyton? No. I don't know what that is. It's first and I have money and everything. They're just say, wait a minute. That's right. But what we don't talk about is people don't understand how to run those numbers because they think if I have 5% interest, well, 5%, $5 for every $100, that's not bad. No big deal. But what happens when we hear this thing called compound interest? That's what Mr. Eugene's talking about. Okay. That's what's, what are you saying to Mr. Eugene? It's interest on top of interest on top of interest on top of interest. It's interest on top of interest on top of interest. Yes, Mr. President. Darren's trying to get in your class, but he's saying I need some code or something. Give me just a minute, students, while I, one of our students is having an issue here. Give me just a second. Okay, sorry about that. Always the first day is where you're going to end up having issues. Um, so, compounded interest, if you don't know what compound interest is, it's basically this. So, if I go over, Mr. Aiden, and I give you 100 bucks, and I tell you I'm going to charge you compound interest at 5%, and I say I'm going to do it daily, well, what happens is, is the first day I've already got $5 from you. The second day I got $5 from you. The third day I got $5. But here's how it works. That's simple interest. But what happens is, is we end up, we start in compounding, we start adding it on top of each other. So we're taking interest and adding interest on top of interest, on top of interest, on top of interest. So it's no longer your principal. We're taking the interest and putting interest on top of the interest. See a problem there? Yeah. Which thing can do what, Mr. Travis? They can pile up. Very they can pile up very, very quickly. Okay. So with that being said, and that's kind of where I, where I want to start here, we're going to move this on over here. Now looky here. Okay. This is a truth in lending disclosure. This is actually a financing document that your clients will sign. So don't look at everything real quick. What we're going to look at right away is we're going to start right here on the third box where it says amount financed. And on this little thing, you can probably barely see it because I blew it up. But what you see here is that in the third box, amount financed, this is the amount of credit provided to you or on your behalf. And this person is taking $393,372.22. Okay. Now we all said eight and five percent is a fair price, right? Well, this individual is getting five point one percent interest. Okay, but Mr. A, what is this middle number here talking about finance charge? What, what's this say? Can you see that up in there? That number? Yeah. Three hundred seventy-nine thousand six hundred forty-nine and eleven cents. And how much are they borrowing? Three hundred ninety-three thousand. What Whoa. a steal! Ooh, that's a lot. Don't you think? And this is only a 30 year note. This is a traditional loan. Look at how much Mr. Saul, can you see that number? Oh yeah. What what's that number of the total they're gonna pay back? Seven hundred and seventy-three thousand eight hundred and twenty one dollars and thirty three cents. Seven 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 three zero two one zero three. Mm -hmm. So close. Very close. But again, think about this. This person is buying a house. It's only about four hundred thousand dollars. They're literally almost paying double back at five percent interest. Mr. Eugene, I got a question. Did you say told us earlier that they used to get up to ten percent? Yeah, ten percent. Imagine what interest rate would have been if that number was ten, and they financed at three ninety three. This would have doubled over here. So they would have paid almost probably 700,000 in just finance and over a million in regards to total payments for a $400,000 house. See, that does not include insurance, Mr. Knowles. That does not include anything. That does not, this is just, this is your loan, it's your mortgage, okay? So in that situation is, Here's the problem, and they didn't, well, yeah, they did, they did a nice little number here in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Their payments are only $2,147 a month. Now, when you see that number, it seems more realistic, right? $2,147.29, and then their last payment, $2,144.22. Now, 
If I'm looking at that bottom left hand corner, that's pretty good. Okay? But really, look at what I'm ending up wanting here. Okay? Now, here's what we're going to talk about in this class. Okay? A lot of people end up, when they talk about real estate finance, one of the key things that they don't think about coming to real estate finance is this. They think, I'm just going to run a bunch of numbers. That's what I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn a bunch of numbers, a math class, and I hate math. And, and how many of y'all hate math in here? Okay? Almost everybody. Okay? Even myself. I hate it. That's why I got a calculator. Okay? But in that situation is, what I try to tell people is, is what we're going to learn in this class is we're going to learn different ways of how finance affects. Because here's the thing. Okay? All of you that are in this class understand in this situation, this isn't your job. As a salesperson, you are not going to go out, Mr. Eaton, and go and tell, say, Marcus here in class. You're not going to go call Marcus and tell Marcus, hey, Marcus, let me, let me go over here and, and let me tell you about all these financing and breaking these numbers down. That's not your job. Your job is to help Marcus find a house. Okay? Your job is to help guide your clients to a house. But you need to know the concept of how real estate financing works so that you can better assist your clients in finding the right house, if you see where I'm coming from. This, okay? So, for example, if this was a house that ended up, say Mr. Marcus was actually purchasing this house, this one that's on our screen, and Mr. Marcus is buying this particular house, and his go is that he built it. He's the builder, all right? He's building the house, do y'all think that Mr. Marcus is actually going to pay the $773,000? No, Mr. Marcus is going to do what? He's going to sell the house after a certain period of time, take the tax benefits, and put the debt on somebody else and walk away with cash value. Do you see how this works? So Marcus might have got a loan for $393,372, and he lives there two years, okay? And after two years, he ends up, he sells it off to Miss Linda, and Miss Linda purchases it from him, and he sells it to Miss Linda. This $400,000 that he built it, sells it to Miss Linda for $773,000. And I'll pass it on to Travis. <laughs> and then at that point, Mr. Marcus did what? He just made himself $300,000. $300,000 profit, and he now has put that house on Miss Linda. Now, Miss Linda has to go and get her own loan. But in these situations is, is you got to look at it from many ways. Now, I'll tell you something. This is not a great, if I'm, I'm just telling you this for real life, this is not the type of loan you put a builder in, period. Okay? No, big no-no. Put an X on that screen, okay? Do not do that. You put your, your builder or your client in here, you're putting them in a very bad situation. Reason being is because they're already financing such a big amount to the payment that it basically puts them in the hole, okay? If they are building, you want to try to get them into what's called a construction loan, and we'll talk about those. It's basically put out at phases. You get parts of it at phases. So if Travis, you're in phase one, the bank would lend you phase one money to get materials. Get to the next one, release money for the next one. Then you could put it in a, and this is the key thing, this is the only time I say this. If Travis, you're building, this is the only time it's acceptable to use a arm loan. Okay, and that's an adjustable rate mortgage. Because what happens is, is Travis, you could end up being in what's called an interest only loan. So your payments aren't going to be two thousand a month. They're probably going to be on this amount, maybe a thousand a month. Okay, but here's the thing. You want to sell that thing as quickly as you possibly can so that you can end up, you don't get hit with that large interest jump, if you see what I'm saying. Okay? But it's stuff like what we're showing here on the screen today that I'm bringing to your attention because this material is extremely important to your overall success as a realtor. See, a lot of people, a lot of real estate agents, it's really sad that this happens, but a lot of real estate agents, they don't actually get this knowledge. A lot of times when they get sponsored, 99% of the time, they, they go join a large company. Once they join a large company, 
uh, they end up broker signs their stuff and they're gone. But they never see the broker again. Or they may see them in the passing in the halls, but they don't actually see their broker anymore. So what happens is, is it puts those agents at a disadvantage versus when you're taught stuff like this, and Travis, you're out there talking to Mr. Eugene, a builder, guess what can happen? Mr. Eugene says, yeah, I went down to my bank and my bank told me I got to pay about 2000 a month for this house that I'm going to build. And, you know, this is my first house I'm building. I don't got a lot of money. And I was hoping a thousand dollars, but I just gave up Travis on even trying, man. You know, I just, I can't do that. And most agents will be like, well, good luck, Mr. Eugene. Yeah, that's, right. yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> but what happens in this situation is you as an agent need to be able to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Who did you talk to? Well, I went down to such and such, you know, uh, Prosperity or Chase or Wells Fargo or one of the big dogs. Well, of course they're not going to do that because they make most of their money off of what? Refinances or purchases, okay? You need to go to this smaller bank that deals with nothing but construction loans. Or you need a mortgage broker that deals with nothing but construction loans, okay? You do that, you get clients. You've got to put the time and the effort into this, okay? So it's things like that that we're going to talk about. So while I'm talking and I'm teaching y'all, understand that, yes, there's going to be some content that we're going to talk about in this class that will bore you to death. Mr. Grossman and Mr. Stahl can tell you. It will bore you to death. Even Mr. Aiden can tell you. It will bore you to death. Okay? I'm not going to lie to you. But in the same situation, what I'm trying to explain to you is this, is it is imperative that you know this so that you can go out and you can help your clients. Guys, I can tell you over my over a decade of working in this industry, I can tell you that this stuff like this, you know these types of things that I got up here on the screen. If you know it just as much as I do, you can end up still clients right and left because their agents don't know. Can't tell you how many times I've talked to new agents and those new agents ended up, they got sponsored, they're told to go out there and get as many clients as they can, and they do. But then when it comes down to the loan documents, they have no idea what they're doing. No idea. And that is the biggest failure that you can do to your client. Okay? The biggest failure whatsoever. A lot of people think this. A lot of people think this. When you go shop for a home, you can only go to one lender. You can only go to one, one lender. That's it. You can only go to one lender. you believe that? That's a lie. Biggest lie out there. When you go and you're looking to purchase a house, you, you go across and you do everybody. Get across the board. Get a, a number across the board. One thing I'm going to tell you guys and gals, when dealing with finance and dealing with lenders, not all lenders are the same. I can tell you from experience, from my past experience, there are some lenders out there that will lie to customers and say, yeah, 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 Aiden, I can get you approved for 2% loan just so they get you to give them the business. Then after they start the process, they see the loan's dead or that they can't get it approved, so then they just MIA on you, okay? That's why it is very important that when you use a lender, you highly recommend to your client that that person better be somebody that you can go over there and either like they always say in real estate, your lender should be close enough where you can go up and give them a hug or you can slap them, okay? That's, that's how close your lender needs to be to you. Because here's the problem. Mr. Eugene, say that in a situation, say that you did not see this form that's up here on the screen. And say, for example, that uh, Mr. Garrett, you know, you called Mr. Garrett off of a TV number. You saw it found him on TV. Call Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett told you, yeah, Mr. Eugene, I can end up, I can get you approved for 2% interest on your loan, sir. I can get you in there. I'm, I'm one of the best uh, lenders out there. So Mr. Eugene signs up, okay, he signs up with them. Next thing you know, Mr. Eugene has done, or went over here, he's got paid all this money and all up front, and then sure enough, a couple of days before closing, Mr. Eugene gets this form right here. And on this form, it shows 5% interest. And at this point, Mr. Eugene tries to call and call and call Mr. Garrett, and what do you think Mr. Garrett's gonna do? He ain't answering that phone. And Mr. and Mr. Garrett, do you think he even lives anywhere near Mr. Eugene? Oh, no. No. Mr. Garrett probably lives in another state, maybe in Washington, D.C. Okay. Mr. Eugene, you going to drive up to D.C. to slap Mr. Garrett? You damn right. <laughs> <laughs> Travis would. Travis would. 
Uh, Mr. Eugene, he, he, <laughs> Mr. Eugene, he's, he's definitely not going to do that. You know, Mr. Eugene's going to say, I, I, I guess I just got to sign this. Okay. I've had situations like this happen where it was a few days before closing. Either the lender bags out or the lender does send something like this to them. And then, they, then the, the client gets upset and who do they come after? Me, the agent. They come after me. Why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't you I, I did. But you chose that person. Don't get mad at me. Okay? So in that situation is you will run into things like this. Okay? You've got to be prepared for these things. But again, you will learn stuff like this as we go through this class. Okay? Yeah. Yes, Miss Linda. Uh, when they when you start this process, they do like a credit check on on their on you too, correct? That is correct. So for you to get pre-approved, you have to get your credit checked. And sometimes they verify employment too to get pre-approved. Let me test y'all's knowledge real quick. Let's see if y'all remember. Mr. Uh, let me think. Mr. Keith. Yes, sir. Question for you, sir. Do you remember the difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval? Oh, pre-qualified. Uh, I believe pre-approved would be mean that you have been pre-approved everything has went through and you're ready to go correct and what was pre-qualified do you remember is it the, is it better I, I, or worse? i'm a little worse that's correct that's correct you got it correct there pre and mr keith great Thank job you. great job so in that situation is mr keith had exactly right if your client comes up to you miss linda and says uh, Miss Linda, here, here, here's my, here's my pre-qualification letter, Miss Linda. There you go. What should you do with it, Miss Linda? I would say you have to be pre-approved. Well, you're, she's being polite. But what did, what did you do, Mr. Eugene? Why are you throwing it in the garbage? That ain't no good to me. I'm be pre-approved. Yeah. Just, See, so for ex, for example, Mr. Marcus here, since he's not been in our class yet. Mr. Marcus, he probably is like, what in the world are y'all talking about throwing papers away? Well, what we're talking about is this. Pre-qualification letter is basically, it weighs as much or is worth as much as probably some trash that you have in your garbage can. That's how much it's worth. Because here's what happens. Mr. Marcus can go online onto Quick, uh, Quick and Loans or Rocket Mortgage. He can go on there and he can go and say, uh, even though I'm a student, I make $5 million and I work at uh, Dollar Tree and uh, and I've got about $10 million in assets. Okay? Well, they're going to spit out him a very large pre qualification letter. Okay? Because they're going off of what Mr. Marcus said. Okay? A pre approval letter is completely different. They actually went and contacted Mr. Marcus's employer. They have verified his income. They have verified his credit. They have verified all of this, meaning that he actually meets their qualifications. Versus if he goes over there and just, he sits back here behind the computer and he's just a, I make $5 million at Dollar Tree, okay? I'm picking with you, Mr. Marcus, just FYI. But in that situation is you can put whatever you want in there, okay? You can put any number and it's going to spit it out. But in that situation is it's worthless. Okay. It's worthless because it's not been verified. You only accept pre-approval letters. If you can become a real estate agent, one of the key things I can tell you guys and gals as a real estate broker is I tell my people, do not go show a house unless they're what, Mr. Aiden? Pre-approved. Pre Why is that important, Mr. Aiden? Because uh, they could be just making your change and using your time on it. Yeah. Do you, do you want to go around and just show houses just because this person just happens to have a day off and wants to just go waste your time? Do you want to do that? No, sir. No. None of us want to work for free. They need to end up, they need to be pre-approved. You will get people that will balk at that and say, no, I'm not getting pre-approved. I'm not ready to buy, but I just want to look. And if I find the house, then I'm... Well, if they just want to be looky-loose, let them be looky-loose. 
Okay, when somebody else. That's right. Because Mr. Stahl, when you show, and you know this yourself, Mr. Stahl, when you show houses, sir, how uh, how often when somebody says, well, I just, when I find the right house, I'll pre-approve. I'll get pre-approved. How often do those ever turn into a pre-approval, sir? They don't. Never, right? Yeah. Very, very rare. You okay. show a couple houses and they just kind of disappear. That's right. You show a few, after you show a few, they're gone. They're out of, they're, they're long gone. They're not going to be basically, uh, you're wasting your time is what you're doing. Okay. So in that particular situation, like I tell people all the time is you want to make certain that as you're doing these things, you need to be aware. Okay. You need to be aware of these different prices. Okay. You need to be aware of these different things because they are all extremely important to your success as a real estate agent. Okay. All right. So let's come back here. Now, when we're talking about mortgage lending activities, now there's many different things. Uh, again, as you can see, savings, local markets, and national markets. Now, every one of these has an effect. Now, unlike the previous classes that we talked about, there was plenty more words <laughs> that was actually on the PowerPoints, okay? For some reason, this one has always been like this. They've always provided very minute information. And what they're trying to do is they want you to read. They want you to go out and read the material. But I know that when you're reading, it can be very hard to comprehend if you don't know what you're reading. Okay. So we're actually going to do this a little backwards here because the way it's wrote is very confusing for many people. Okay. Here's what happens. The national level, the national markets, Wall Street or any of the larger scale, Wall Street Journal or, or the, the major national share companies, these are all going to be ones that ultimately, if you think about it, they control what everybody does down the scale. It's just like our law. If you ever taken any law classes, business law or any things of that nature, they always tell you the Constitution basically what? It's the rule of the law. It's the law of the land. This is it. Okay? So when we're talking about this at the mortgage lending, what we're talking about is it from this standpoint. The national markets affect how the local markets are going to be dealt with. Okay? Right now, our national markets are hurting with COVID and everything else that's going on. What's the problem here? Well, people are unemployed. And when people are unemployed, they don't have money to spend. And if they don't have money to spend, what happens to the local markets? They sink, they crash, okay? So the national market has to do what? We've got to push money back into the businesses, okay? So we got to take money and give it to people. But here's the problem. If, I'm, if I am Congress, or I'm the president, whatever you want to call it, if I'm up in the national level, and I walk over to you, Mr. Aiden, and I take out a check and I give you $2,000. What is my intent for Aiden to do with that $2,000? Put it in something. I want him to spend it, right? I want to put it in to somewhere where it's going to do what? It's going to create jobs. Okay. <clears throat> do I want Aiden in any shape or form? Do I want Aiden to go put it in his bank account? Nope. And save it. No, because if he takes that $2,000 check and he puts it in his savings account, what happens? Stays there. Then do nothing. No. Doesn't do nothing. Doesn't do nothing. So I might as well not even gave him the check. That's right. Okay. So the key thing that comes down to it is the government, when they give stimulus, if you think about the word stimulus, what does it basically mean? Stimulate, the economy. Stimulate the economy. Let's get it going. Okay. The problem is, is most people do what? Well, here's the problem. Now, especially for the longevity that we've been in, if I give him two thousand dollars and you're his landlord, you're going to do what? You're going to have to pay him to stay in your house, right? So you give it to Mr. Eugene. Now, what does Mr. Eugene do? He goes and puts it in his savings account. Does that do anything for the economy? Not at all. Okay. So in that particular situation is the whole point of the stimulus checks was to end up, and we had our last recession under the Bush and Obama administration, 
we weren't at this point where our economy was dead. Everybody could still get out and do things. So we were able to still go buy stuff. Well, now with us being under a stay at home order, where a lot of people are stuck at home, what ends up happening is, is people are just paying their landlords. And the landlords, if they're smart, educated individuals, they aren't really hurt right now. So when they get their checks from Mr. Aiden, Mr. Eugene's already probably been paying his mortgage, even though Aiden's not there. So he's just going to put that in his savings account. So it still does not stimulate the economy. Okay. So a lot of people will say, well, what's the next best way of doing things? Well, let's put it into the hands of big business. Okay. Well, again, pretty wise decision to a point if you're stimulating them to keep their employees. Okay. That's why the PPP loan is out right now. The goal of the PPP loan is to what? Make people to stay employed. We want to keep them going. Okay. So, Mr. Eugene, we don't want you firing Travis. We'll give you money to keep Travis. Okay. So in that situation, Travis ends up, <laughs> Travis ends up, he, ha he gets to keep his job, okay? But the thing is, is here's the problem. Is the money still going to who? Still going to Mr. Eugene. And when you give a PPP to Mr. Eugene, what has it where it says that Mr. Eugene can't end up cutting Travis's hours? It just says that he has to stay employed. So in that situation, Mr. Travis went from full-time to part-time, okay? And Mr. Eugene still what? Cashing in, okay? So in that situation is, guys and gals, it's imperative that you see how the market and how the lending activities at, uh, work. When the market is slow, okay, mortgages are going to sometimes be slow. But here's the thing. This is how our markets work. A lot of people are saying, well, how in the world, how in the world, Justin, is the, basically, not even just this area, but Texas in general, why is Texas economy so hot right now? Why can't we keep houses on the market? They're just flying off the market. Okay? Well, here's the thing. The reason it's hot right now is because Mr. Eugene just ended up, got a bunch of stimulus checks that came to him, and now interest rates are what? When we want to end up in some situation, we want to stimulate the economy, do we raise interest or do we lower interest? We lower it. So now Mr. Eugene has all these stimulus checks that his tenants have paid. Now Mr. Eugene does what? i got a ton of extra cash in my account. I'm going to go buy me some more houses. Okay? And interest rates are low. So I'm going to go definitely buy a bunch. So the reason that houses are flying off the market isn't because somebody like Aiden is going to buy a house. It's because people that have money, investors, are taking advantage of it. Okay? So when we come into these situations, the key point that comes into this is that we are seeing in some of these aspects, you will see how the national markets, the local markets, and even savings can have a big impact in regards to how lending happens. Lending, mortgage lending, can be very beneficial, but it can also be very difficult too, depending on how you're looking at it, okay? Mortgage lending is all gonna be based, however, off of the Fed. And we're gonna talk about the Fed later, okay? But the Fed actually controls and dictates how this lending occurs, okay? Now, in real estate, of course, we have cycles. We have supply and demand, and we have supply and demand of the housing and money, okay? If there is a lot of houses on the market that are available, we call it what? A lot of houses on the market. Is it a buyer's or a seller's market? What do you think? Buyers. Why do you call it a buyer's market? Because you have a lot of options. You have a lot of inventory. Ton of inventory. So if there's a ton of inventory, Mr. Grossman will come back to you, sir. If your client that you've been trying to work with has a contingency and they want to upgrade their house, okay, 
Would you want them to have one where there's a lot of houses in the market or limited houses? Why is that? Because they might get turned down by several because they have contingency. That's correct. So in that situation, when there's a lot of houses on the market, it ends up in that particular situation. It makes life good for everyone. Okay. So what I tell people this all the time is, is when we're dealing with this, is it is very important that if there's a lot of supply, then what happens is, is it's a buyer's market. If there is limited houses, limited supply, it is a seller's market. Right now, in our area, what do you think it is, Mr. Aiden? Buyers or seller's market? Buyers. Buyers market? Okay. Mr. Grossman, what do you think? Um, I would say it's a buyer's market, yeah. You say buyer, Mr. Stahl, do you agree? I would say sellers, I feel like there's a lot of houses up for sale. Uh, I'm trying to see people come in, to, people aren't looking to buy because of COVID. So I've got a seller, Ms. GG. Seller, but again, seller. Ms. Linda? I would say half and half. Really. No, one, one or the other. Oh, I mean, can't, you can't cheat out that man. Come on now. Okay. I'm going to, what I've been seeing lately, I would say. And I'm not a betting person, but I would say a buyer's market. Okay. The actual situation that we're seeing right now is actually it's a seller's market. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Reason why is this. Houses are selling very quickly. Very quickly. Um, and a lot of times they're selling in what, Miss Linda? Loans or cash? Cash. Cash deals. Okay. Miss Linda made a comment to me the other day. She said, God lead, Justin. Now, where are all these people coming from with that kind of money just to throw down 300, 400,000 in cash? Well, like we talked about earlier, if they're getting a lot of things from their stimulus checks and they get PPP money, they got cash. They got cash on hand and they can go and end up, they can buy houses in cash. Okay? But again, understand. Now, let, let, let's look back here for a second. If there is limited cash, do you think there's going to be much, uh, much house sell or house buying if there's limited cash? There's less money that's being able to be put to the banks that can lend. Well, guess what happens? Less money means less people buying. Okay. So when we're looking at that, there's normally a, a cycle that's going on. You have a lot of houses. But end up a little money, which makes it a seller's market. I mean, I'm sorry, buyer's market. But if you end up, you have a lot of cash but little inventory, it's the seller's market. Okay? So all of these basically create our cycle that we have in the real estate industry. Now, things that affect these cycles, if you notice, not only, let's go back here for a minute. Not only do these items from slide one affect how the real estate market goes, but also these. See, here's the thing. A lot of people right now, if you live in, uh, Miss Leela, I've got a question for you, actually. Yes. Miss Leela, do you think that people are, let me, let me say this. Why do you think people are, are moving here to Texas in droves from California? Why are they doing that? They want to suck up our air. <laughs> Good question. Good like answer. <laughs> um, no, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. Um, from what I've, what I've gathered when I did ask this question with quite a few people, they were saying that um, the job markets were greater or better in Texas and that the housing markets, especially in California, was just, they just couldn't live there. They couldn't afford it anymore. Exactly. And the houses here were affordable. Exactly. Did you know, Miss Lila, we actually did a study the other day. The house 
just a basic one story house. It's about 1500 square feet in California. Goes approximately for about seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars. So, just a basic oh my God. house. So imagine how many houses you could buy here in Texas if you sell your house for seven eight hundred thousand dollars and you move into Houston or you move into Austin, you probably could purchase three or four houses. And think about it from this way. If Aiden, let's say he moved in from California, he moved here, guess what happens? Mr. Aiden could come over here, buy four houses, live in one, rent three, and technically be set for the rest of his life off the rent of his homes. No state income. And no state income tax. So in these situations, as Ms. Lila was 100% there, she's correct. Because the fact is, is not only is the housing market over there crazy, but the jobs are not as good. I have a, a person that I am meet or talking with each week, and he told me, he said, Justin, he says, I moved from Texas to Los Angeles. And he said, Justin, we're under a stay-at-home order where we can't even leave our house. We can't go anywhere. We have to stay at home for 14 days. And I said, well, how are you making a living? And he says, we're not. He says, we're not getting paid. We're sitting at home. Those of us that have jobs that can be done online, we're good, but everybody else isn't making money. And they got a $600 check to live off of. Okay? So in that particular situation, as you can tell, there are concerns that do affect why people do what they do. So why in the world is California, why are they flocking over here? Because things are cheaper here. It's cheaper. You can end up, you can get a job that pays pretty well. Not as well as California, but pretty decent. Okay? And you got all this money that you got from your houses that you can buy multiple houses here. Okay? It is a win-win. Other factors, things like tax rules. There are a lot of benefits in tax rules. Right now, like we said earlier, you end up, say for example, that... Um, Say Mr. Uh, Aiden here. Mr. Aiden goes over, and Mr. Aiden knows under the tax rules that if he and his wife end up, they go out and they purchase a home, okay, and he buys a house for two hundred fifty thousand, and it triples in value. He can write off because he's married five hundred thousand dollars, and I have to pay any money on that. So if his house sells for two or seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he paid two fifty, guess what? Aiden gets to pocket five hundred thousand dollars in his pocket because of the tax code benefits. Okay. So in those situations, is guys and gals, it's very key when it comes down to basically the factors that affect the overall real estate market. Also, social attitudes. There can be certain people that may end up, this isn't just in real estate general, but social attitudes can also affect things as well. Not only from a national scale, like moving from California to Texas, but even internally, even within an area. For example, what is it? Uh, that's what it is, the third ward. If I ever say the third ward, Travis, to you, what does that mean to you? What, what pops in your head? Or is it the fifth ward? I'm trying to think which ward it is. Miss Lila, I'm going to need your help for a minute. Which ward is it? That's Why in you got to call me? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the only one that lives over in Houston that I think I got on watch. Um, and what it? Well, third ward. Yeah, it is correct. There is a third and there's a fifth, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what point you were trying to make. Are they are they more low income? I guess is my question. Or run down those areas. Third war, third war, excuse me, was it, it this a major fluctuation? At one point, it was a very large Caucasian community. Okay. From what I was told, it was mostly Jewish. Okay. And then they moved out to the suburb areas. And this is many years ago, of course. And of course, the property went down. So it's more you would consider poor. Um, then it shifted again, what they call gentrification. And so at one point, 
you can get a house at a good friend who bought a house for $40,000 and it was a nice size home uh, because the area was poor. His house is now over 300 worth over 300,000. So you really can't even buy in that property unless you're looking at maybe four or 500,000. So it just depends on the area of third ward. Some areas are still relatively poor, but a large portion of it isn't because it's now valuable land. So see, so that's key. So in that situation, that shows you right there the difference. I mean, just like what Ms. Leela said, it shows exactly the cycle, how it can go from one to where it is poor, where it ends up coming back, and it just, it's a cycle. It goes around and around. That's what I tell people all the time is, it can be the social attitude. Sometimes, unfortunately, in real estate, homes are automatically, or not just a home, but an area is automatically stigmatized. That this area, you don't want to live there because it's low income. So you don't want to live there. But the problem is, is here's the thing, is that, like she said, her friend ended up purchasing a property for $40,000, guys and gals, $40,000. You think about this. If you bought that house even for $40,000 and it's worth three or 400 now, you did a very good investment, okay? So it's kind of like we want to use Brian, just using downtown Brian. I remember when I was younger, downtown Brian, that was just horrible. All of the main streets downtown were just crappy. The buildings were crappy. Things were falling in. It was horrible until they revitalized it in the early 2000, it was about 2008, 2009, 2010, they started revitalizing it. But again, the key thing is, is that you do have these different places where people end up, they have social attitudes, they have opinions about certain properties. I could probably go to each and every one of you and say, you know, back in your hometown, where's the area to stay away from? And you would all tell me a time, a place, where to stay away from. They tell you, don't go here, don't go there, don't do this, or don't do that. Mr. Uh, Grossman, you probably, if I asked you when you were younger, what was the place in Austin that was not a place you wanted to be? And I bet you would go down there now with the time lapse, probably be a completely different environment. Okay. So in those situations is you can end up sometimes you will see changes in real estate. Real estate always changes. That's one of the key things, but there are cycles that we go through, okay? Demographics. There can also be certain demographics, okay? I remember when I was younger, they'd always ask, which side of the railroad do you live on, okay? That's basically a demographic. They basically classify which side you were on is what classified you as either wealthy or poor. Okay, so in that particular situation is the demographics also play a, a opinion in regards to how we deal with cycles. Okay, so very important when we're dealing with this for many different elements. Now, the impact that we had on the financial crisis. Okay, the key thing about this PowerPoint here is that there was a huge impact. Back in 2008, 2009, 2010, we had a huge impact, okay? And one of the key things that we ended up happening was is that people were losing their houses. They're being foreclosed on, okay? See, what once used to be, and this used to actually be the statement, we, when they would ask, you know, Mr. Eugene would talk to an investment advisor, and, and Mr. Eugene would say, well, Mr. Uh, Aiden, I've got hundred thousand dollars I want to invest sir where should I put it at Mr. Aiden used to always tell him well Eugene where else would you want to put it at you want to put it in the mortgage industry because it's untouchable it, it will always be there it's solid it's very strong it's got a strong foundation and the collateral is very strong so you want to put your money in where into the mortgage industry so millions if not billions of dollars was put a people's retirement into the mortgage market tons of money tons and tons and tons of money and then all of a sudden in 2007 and 2008 that that untouchable market popped and it just poof, and there it went poof. and all these people's retirements 
their investments and everything just delete it just like that gone so people and some of you might know people some of you may still know people that actually went through it there were four there were, let me put it this way we're not talking four people we're talking people that they had money and they had good money and had it in the market and lost every penny you classify them as very well off people we're now broke okay they went from millions in the bank to zero dollars yes mr eugene you're correct they're actually win the market mr eugene's telling me show me the deal in 2008 when the mortgage market bubble crashed people literally were jumping out of their office building windows they seriously were because they they would rather kill themselves than have to call up that old client of theirs that was about to retire that had trusted them for years and years and years and years with their money and tell them that they were now broke they had nothing imagine in this situation mr aiden here imagine you worked 60 years of your life you worked your butt off and you ended up you gave your money to mr grossman back there to manage and mr grossman was following what everybody else is doing and then all of a sudden you're getting ready to retire and mr grossman calls you and says yeah because some people made poor financial decisions you now are bankrupt you have nothing and you're not probably ever going to be able to retire. Mm -hmm. See a problem there? Yep. Very good point. Uh huh. So, in that particular situation, is this is that you have to understand, and I'll explain why. A lot of people are like, well, what caused it? What, what exactly, Mr. Nobles, what caused it? It doesn't just happen. Well, here's what happened. It's exactly what happened. Okay. What was going on prior to all of the Dodd-Frank Act and all that, we're going to talk about this class. What happened was, was this situation. Mr. A, you ended up, you wanted to go get a mortgage. Okay, so previously, with all the regulations, it was not as regulated. You want to get a mortgage. You would just go down to Miss Linda, to the bank, and Miss Linda, as you tell her, you want to buy a house for $300,000. You tell Miss Linda, I want I'm buying a house for three hundred. Miss Linda would be like, "Hey, you've been with me for so long. Just you just come on through the drive through. I'll get you a check, okay?" That's exactly true. And you drive through. Miss Linda would have you sign some paperwork, and then they would release the money to you, okay? Or they would let you close on. Okay. Well, here's the problem: is on all of the information that you told Miss Linda, you lied. Told Miss Linda that you had got a job promotion and that you were working, or that you now instead of making a hundred thousand a year, you're making two hundred and fifty. Okay, so he lied about it. He didn't. He really doesn't have it. He's just lying. Miss Linda, been bait with him forever. She trusts him. All right, Miss Gaten, here you go. So Mr. Aiden buys a house, and here's the problem. If y'all remember from our pre previous classes, and we'll talk about it in this one, Miss Linda pulls her, her debts together and sells them off to the secondary market. Okay? Well, here's the problem. What happens if Miss Linda puts a lot of, and by the way, they call them prime and subprime loans. Prime loans are your A plus, these are your, if you're doing it for students, this would be your A students, A and B students, okay? Subprime are your D and F students, okay? So in that in that situation, what was happening was Miss Linda was selling off prime loans to Travis, who's the government, selling them off to Wall Street back there, and telling Travis these are prime loans. They're not going to default. But she still says these subprime ones that she would send to. But here's the problem. When Miss Linda is sending off prime loans that are actually subprime, what happens to the market? It's eventually going to do what? 
going to crash because what's going to happen here is a situation is they are going to end up those prime loans are going to end up popping those prime and i'm putting that quotation prime they're going to pop but see here's the thing when miss linda sold it off to travis travis of course puts it on wall street which everybody that has life insurance money and investment money out are buying into that pot in hopes of making money. Well, when that pot goes dry, so does all their investments. So in that situation, what happened was there was a lot of loans that ended up in that particular situation that it did not just hit the housing market. It had a ripple effect across everything. Life insurance, investments, everything. I went back and looked at our, our numbers in Bryan College Station for real estate agents. Pre-2008, I think we had almost close to two, 3,000 agents in Bryan College Station. Post-2008, I think we had approximately about 600 people. That was it. And the number steadily dropped. There was only a few agents in Bryan College Station at the time. Now the market is picking back up again, going back up. But the key thing is, is now they're saying the next bubble that's about to pop is what? Uh, deals with him, him, student loan, student loan debt. Student loan debt. So in that particular situation here, when we're dealing with student loans, people are taking out too much money and they can't pay it back. And guys and gals, we saw earlier today that that was 5% up here on the, on the deal. That's 5%. Guess what? Y'all ready? Student loan interest rates is at 6%. So, Mr. Aiden, you go take out a hundred thousand dollar loan. You gonna pay back, sir? Probably two hundred thousand plus the hundred to check. You gonna pay about three, four hundred thousand dollars back, sir? Yeah. So, in that particular situation, is that's problematic. Yeah. Okay. So, what's going into this situation is, is that the impact of the financial market can have a huge impact on all of us every one of us okay so when we're going through these particular situations we have to understand the importance that we must understand in regards to everyday life okay because it does ultimately play a very big factor okay so the questions that students always end up having in every single class is this situation they'll say well mr nobles i got a problem sir They'll say, what exactly do we end up dealing with? What exactly are we going to be facing? What's going to happen to the real estate market after the, if the student loan bubble pops? One of the proposal right now, a huge proposal that got a lot of people scared. And I kind of actually like to talk about this is because of this situation. A lot of people are worried. They are worried. Because we, within less than a few days, will have a new president. And at that point, one of the key things that they said was he wants to raise minimum wage, $15 an hour, and he wants to unilaterally wipe student loan debt, where those, well, those will get 10000 wiped out, and then anybody that makes less than $100,000 attended a public institution would end up having their debt wiped, okay? The problem is, is number one, it's good and bad. Good thing is, is from this situation, good thing is, is that if we end up wiping people's debt and we give them $15 an hour, they're gonna do what? They're gonna buy, they're gonna buy houses and they're gonna do a lot. It's gonna increase real estate Crazy. Okay. But here's the problem. If we raise everybody to $15 an hour, what happens to that McDonald's job, Aiden, that you're working? 
you're getting fifteen dollars an hour, and everybody in there gets fifteen dollars an hour. What's going to happen to uh, the value or the prices of food at McDonald's? It's going to go crazily up. They're going to automate. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. It won't be a dollar menu. It'll be a ten dollar menu. Twenty dollars. That's right. So in that, yeah. that's right, 10 nuggets for $30, that's right. But the key thing that comes into this that I try to tell everybody is understand from this perspective, okay? You have to understand when we're looking at these things, there can be good and bad. There's always good and bad, it always is. People always say, well, you know, if we don't do this and we should do this or this, well, the problem is, is in finance, there is no perfect answer. A lot of people will give proposals. Should people make $15 an hour? I can have people up here debating it back and forth. Should student loans be wiped? I can have that back and forth. Should your mortgages on your house be wiped? Yes. See, you see the difference here? You see the difference here? You see what I'm See, oh, yeah. the, the key thing that comes into this is that you got to understand that there never is a perfect solution, okay? And you can't please everybody. You're right there, Mr. Eugene. You can't. But the key thing that you can do is you have to understand, we try different things. We do the best we can. One thing that you'll see, like we talked about up here, there's a lot of things that do X are basically impact the day-to-day -day lives of real estate. Okay, it always does. But what you have to be aware of, and it's very key that you understand, <coughs> we have to ensure by all means, we have to make certain that people understand <coughs> that there are things like this that are factors that are outside of our normal realm that are impacting the decisions of the financial industry every single day, okay? Real estate finance is a very important concept that we're going to talk about. There's a lot of things we're going to go into. There's a lot of things we're going to be discussing. There's a lot of things that ultimately play a bigger effect on the overall picture. Okay? But understand, there are going to be many things in this class, such as tax rules, demographics, social attitudes. All of these are things that are playing constantly within the real estate environment, okay? One of the things that I want to make certain to everybody, and I want you all to understand this, do not think that you have to know every little thing. It's impossible. It's impossible for one person to know everything about finance. Finance is constantly changing every day. But the key point in this particular situation is that you must, as a real estate agent, your job, and I'm going to tell you this, and this is something I'm going to say just as a side note, okay? When you get your real estate license, one of the key things, if you were to join my brokerage, one of the key things that I tell my agents all the time, and I tell my students too this, one of the key things that you need to do as a new real estate agent, you need to interview a ton, a ton of lenders. Ms. Linda, why do you think I, I mandate or tell my, my agents that they need to interview lenders? What's the importance of it? It's because when you have a client and they have to be um, approved, you, if you have a lender on hand, they're going to give you the best interest rates. They're going to go over and beyond, usually. Um, are they going to be willing to uh, be pull a... strings that they wouldn't normally pull? Yep. Yeah. Guys and gals, I'll tell you something real quick, a real, to add on to what you just said. I had a lender, I still have a lender, that every other bank declined this person. I called my lender and I told my lender, I said, hey, I said, I got somebody that I, I want to get pre-approved. What can we do to make it happen? And I promise you, she probably spent at least a week looking at every option, looking at everything, trying to find 
what they could do to get this lady pre-approved. Jason, what is that for me? Yeah. Yeah. And that situation, and that situation is, she did finally get her approved. And not only did she get her approved, but she got her at one of the lowest interest rates that she could. The key thing here, guys and gals, is this. Your broker, of course, is going to give you their people. They're going to tell you. But it does not hurt for you to go out individually and get your own people. And here's the best part about it. Mr. Uh, Garrett, so I've got a question for you. Yes, sir. Mr. Garrett, do you like to eat? Yes, sir. Do you like to eat fancy food? Uh, yeah, I guess. And do you like it free? Ooh. I'll take it. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So you ready, Mr. Garrett? I'm gonna tell all of you this. You ready? When you call a lender, most lenders will love to take you out to the most fanciest restaurant, and it's on the bank. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out with lenders and the lenders bought my food. And I'm not talking cheap food. I'm talking, we're going to five-star restaurants, okay? They do that, and why do you think they end up doing that, uh, Mr. Garrett? Why do you think that they turn around and they want to take you, sir, out on a fancy restaurant? Why do you, why do you think they want to wine and dine you? To secure another customer. Exactly. They know that if they take Mr. Garrett out to Christopher's or the Republic here in town, Mr. Garrett, and they let Mr. Garrett do whatever he wants, Mr. Garrett's going to end up most likely do what? Hey, Miss Linda, you looking for a loan? I got a perfect person. Mr. Aiden back there, or Mr. Aiden here, he ends up, he, he, he's the guy to go to. Let's go, Aiden. Okay. Yeah. So in that situation is here, the key point is that you want to understand that sometimes you go over there and things like that can be beneficial. I always tell people, I always tell my agents, I'm like, hey, you want a free meal? You want something nice? Go call a lender up. Y'all go out on a nice, nice meal. You want that Starbucks, Travis, that you've been wanting? Or you want that Minuti coffee? You call up, you call up that title company, tell them you want to go eat with them for breakfast. They'll do it. Need that alcohol, Miss Linda? No. <laughs> what, what, what happened the other day, Miss Linda? We had a basket delivered here, and it was nothing but extravagant wines and crackers and olives and everything else in it. That's right. You want that fancy stuff, you want to have a good relationship. Mr. Travis. Yes. Yeah. I want you to... Talk loud for me. I want you to end up tell them you haven't even known this lender very long. Haven't even have you done a yeah, you've done a deal with me, haven't you? Or not yet? Yeah. Nothing's close. Nothing's close. Right. But you're working on one. Yeah. What happened to this lender that you really don't even barely know? What ended up happening uh, when an issue, a personal matter happened in your life? What what did he end up doing? Oh, I'll, I'll talk about it. So, so, yeah. In early December, my father actually passed away. And I got a bunch of cards of people and a bunch of flowers. We were all in Galveston with my mom, you know, making sure we're all together for a few weeks and everything. And the biggest gift I got was from our lender. We sent a, basically a care package that was a like full sized cardboard box full of books and, you know, like bathroom equipment and you know, soaps and toiletries and. I mean, it was a gigantic box and a really nice blanket, uh, like all sorts of stuff that we, I mean, it was a super nice box. And I mean, he is genuinely a really good guy. I can tell he's not doing it just for the sale, but, or, but you know, yeah, but I mean, in the same situation, it's, it, it creates a, a connection, a, yeah. a connection with those people that had your back. Yeah. And in real estate, that's very key. The people that you surround yourself with is very key to your success. 
Guys and gals, I can call that lender that Travis just talked about, and I can call him right now and say, hey, I need something. And by the way, this lender does not live in my area. He lives in Belton, Belton, Texas. And I could call him right now and say, hey, Jake, I need you. And within probably two hours, he'd probably be here. And he would drop everything come down. That's the importance in regards to having those connections, okay? That's the importance in regards to ending up working together. A lot of agents will say, well, I'll just share who my broker is, who my broker uses. That's fine, don't get me wrong, that's fine. But also in some situations, you want to create your own relationships. You want to create your own connections. Because guys and gals, what might work for me and my clients may not work for you and your clients, okay? It's very key that you understand that difference there because of the fact is, is that we have to make certain by all means, we have to keep those connections going. Now, I will tell you, if you wanna get good leads, one of the key things is, is I can't tell you in this situation that Jake, he will sometimes, now he can't directly force a client to come to my firm, but he will end up, if a person does not have an agent, he'll ask them if they don't have an agent, he'll get them pre-approved and then share our firm's information with them. So one of the key things is, is if you want a free lead generation source, if Aiden wants to get a client, and Aiden wants to gain about 300 pounds, but he wants to get clients, Guess what Aiden could do? He could talk to every single lender around town, not just in Bryan College Station, but Houston and Austin and everything, and find those lenders that don't already have the connections and pick up five or six lenders and he just gets free meals to go eat with them and then he just gets free leads just coming in. And no splits or anything. Huh? That's how you put all the weight. That's how you put all the weight? <laughs> That's, that's exactly how I put mine on. <laughs> so I can tell you, the fact of the matter is, is that yes, it does end up in these situations is that you do want to create those connections. Okay, you do want to create those. All right, so with that being said, that basically covers our slides for this evening. So here's what's going to happen. I am going to see if I cannot find a, one of the videos I used to have that I showed during this class. If I can find it, I want to put it up in Google Classroom. Uh, it is not a mandatory, like I'm going to test you over the content, okay? But it gives you a very good diagnosis of how real estate works and how financing works, okay? I'm going to try to get that video. If I can, I'm going to put it in the Google Classroom. If I can't, um, I, well, I'll find it. Just give me some time, but I'll find it. But I'll put it in there for you all. Uh, I know, yes, Ms. Linda, question? No. Okay. Uh, so if there's anything in regards to the material that you don't understand, let me know, okay? I will tell you that the slides for this course is a lot shorter than it is in the previous classes that we've had. So much information on them. I know, can't you tell right there? It's a ton of information up here. I mean, this, this is a lot here. So, and, and the key things for those of you that are sitting at home right now, I've got three people in here that's wanting to teach these courses. And so, uh, so they, they're like looking at these slides going, uh, how do you teach this? And I'm like, well, you just say, this guy's sad, this girl looks bored, and there's some things going up with foreclosures. If that's so, all I gotta say, then we're good. Oh, we're, yeah, we're good. <laughs> oh yeah, next slide. <laughs> next slide, right? So, but no, we'll end up, we'll get all of that information in there for y'all. Uh, again, we do have uh, people that will be adding or coming into the classes as we go along. Uh, I'm glad to have everybody here. Again, everybody's welcome. And for those of you that are at home and if we're talking or you got questions or whatever, like I've told my previous students, do not hesitate to hit the unmute button and talk, okay? Uh, we will not, we do not make fun of anybody. All questions are, are taken seriously. And we got to so, fill up two hours. Uh, and we got to fill up two hours, exactly. <laughs> so in that situation, we're good, okay? So if you've got questions or whatever, please do not hesitate to ask. 
I do not mind you uh, asking questions, uh, but we're going to go ahead and call this one a class. Um, give me just a second. 